have a citizenship it's 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 there something that's missing and when refugees come in the united states and are able to obtain that citizenship that speaks to to a volume that they now they have a country where they belong to now they have a sense of belonging and they are able to um, express their mind express their thought and sky is the only limit to their thoughts and vision you're listening to seeking refuge a podcast about the human story behind refugees your host for this week is tyler jackson I just want to thank Amadio for coming to speak with us today. Sure. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Amadio Giri, and probably by now you might hear some accent. Uh, I, yes, I was born in down south of Bamberg. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, actually, I was born in Bhutan, a tiny Himalayan country in um, South Asia. And Amadeo, you... Oh yourself are a former refugee from Bhutan, correct? That's true, yes, sir. Um, so when were you forced to flee Bhutan? Um, well, well, when I was uh, very young, um, actually when I was two years old in 1990, when the government of Bhutan implemented one nation, uh, one ethnic policy, then my family, including other uh, Nepali ethnic people, became the victim. So that's when my family um, flew the country. And how was that journey from Bhutan? Where was your final destination? Well, um, first, first it was India because uh, my family was not sure if this was going to be a permanent uh, move. They were just hoping the situation to get better so that they can return back to Bhutan because that's where they had their property, that's where they had their home, that's where my dad had a business. So we, we just moved to India that was bordering Bhutan at that time. We stayed in India, uh, bordering Bhutan for a couple years, and uh, eventually we ran out of money uh, because the money that my dad saved, um, that he earned from his business, was running out. And um, we had a big family. Um, I have six siblings, um, and my parents in itself. Um, it was quite hard for him. That's when we moved to Nepal. And in Nepal, were there other Bhutanese refugees living there as well? Uh, there, there were. There were. Um, it, it was very informal in eastern Nepal back then because uh, the UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee, was not um, settled there then, so there was no any uh, formal camps being established then, but the people were scattered all over the eastern Nepal, especially there is a town called um, Maidhar, and that's where most of the people were. And what was life like in this informal settlement that you were living in? What uh, were the biggest challenges that you and your family might have faced on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, until then, we were still renting one of uh, the house. We were informally living in um, the camp. Um, so from what I remember, the situation was very tough because we used to see all this infant dying because of improper health care. Um, and we, they were just um, living on the bank of a river, uh, my river. And that, that was insane because there was no proper food, there was no proper diet, there was no proper nutrition, there was no proper health care. So all this infant was dying. And I still remember my mother saying and staying on the front porch of a house and counting on the funeral, the body that being transported to the other part of the river where um, it was cremated. 
it sounds like um, your the fa- situation of you and your family um, was at least more fortunate than that of others who were living in um, more informal settlements or without a house. That's that's correct, and that was only because that did not go go long. That was only because uh, my dad was still able to support the family uh, because he had business. And uh, when he left Bhutan, my my uncle was still there who was handling that business for my dad. Um, and until then, the government of Bhutan had not um, all demolished our property, our building and our business. So there was a little bit of income that my uncle was able to uh, pass it over to us uh, from the business that my dad had. And so how long was it before you were contacted by the UN and offered resettlement in a third country? Um, well, uh, before we jump to that, I think um, there is a little bit, a little longer process to that because when when people started to die, when the, there was a infant mortality rate was going up because they were leaving in the bank of the river, then formally UNHCR came um, in place. So they wanted to establish this refugees camp made of a bamboo and plastic. Um, so they partnered with the government of Bhut- Nepal so that they can formally establish a refugee camp um, in a jungle where you need to um, get rid of all those bushes and cut down the trees and make your um, hut there. So that was a long process. It was um, almost 18 years. So once they formalized this camp setting, uh, was that where you and your family moved to, or did you stay in the house that you were living in? Um, No, eventually uh, the government of Bhutan uh, demolished our property back in Bhutan. And, of course, um, they they get rid of our businesses so there was no source of income for my uncle to send money to so when that money stopped coming from there then we were forced to um, get the life in the refugee camp and moved in a camp in itself um, and build up a hut and started living there was that a big change for you Yes, it was a huge change because um, we were living under the plastic tent then and there was um, snakes coming around. There were uh, all these bugs coming around and uh, you had to, the way of cooking was you need to go um, find wood, woods from from the forest so that you can cook something and the sanitation was not very good and of course um, we were there was a lot of people living in a small place so that in itself speaks a volume what kind of situation that we all were living in so it was a kind of adjustment for us so it'd be fair to say that there wasn't um, at least much public health infrastructure present, even in the formal setting of the camp? No, not, not, not initially and not throughout the time, no. And so how long was it after that establishment of the formal camp that UNHCR reached out or offered resettlement in a third country? Um, well, uh, within this 18 years of time in refugee camp, uh, the more uh, foreign aid were being um, given to the refugees so that UNHCR would run education system, so that UNHCR would run healthcare system. It wasn't up to that mark, but still there was, some, as a saying, that something is better than nothing. There was something, but it wasn't everything. It wasn't qualitative. Um, so in that regards, um, eventually um, the refugee in itself, they tried more than 18 times to be repatriated um, into their back to their homeland. They did uh, marching 
when we march from India, I mean, um, from Nepal to Bhutan, we had to go via India. India would not let us go. This was a peace marches that, that happened multiple, multiple times. And when, when that was, the door for repatriation was closed, then you and it, sir, eventually um, came up with a durable solution. And on the durable solution, there were three options, repatriation, um, third country resettlement and local integration. So local integration in itself was impossible because of the fact that Nepal in itself is an underdeveloped country and and then the peace and there was instability in the country in itself. So when that both repatriation and local integration um, option was not possible, that's when the um, UNHCR offer third country resettlement um, with help of um, countries like U.S., uh, Netherlands, New Zealand, Australia, Denmark, um, and such. So it only came once they had exhausted all other options. That's correct. So describe how that process was. Did So the UNHCR reached out to the refugees living in the camp and offered resettlement in a third country that is not specific like United States or New Zealand, just in general? Um, not, not necessarily that, but, it, and, and uh, of course, I think um, I, it, this is very important to let your um, audience know that the people wanted to repatriate it to their country. They, they wanted to go back to Bhutan because that's where they belong. That's where their family are from. That's where they had their businesses. All they know was Bhutan and their lifestyle. So for UNHCR to come suddenly and tell them, you are, we want to resettle you to U.S. or Netherlands or New Zealand or Denmark, it was kind of a shocking to hear for most of the people because you can only imagine the most majority of the um, uh, refugees were illiterate then. So, um, and w when we talk about U.S., of course, everyone wants to um, be in U.S. or, or so-called first world. Uh, but to these folks who are illiterate, they had uh, this fear in their mind that, um, what will I do when I go to U.S. because I don't speak English. Uh, my lifestyle does not match with their lifestyle. Uh, how I would find a job when, there, where I, when I could not speak English. So there was some sort of fear that's being surrounded um, within those group of population. But for those who were able to obtain a little bit of education and a little bit educated, they, 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 they knew that this is going to be an option for them to start up a new life. So in that scenario, there were two groups that are being divided that one would like to see uh, resettlement happening and the other one would like to see uh, repatriation happening. And when, when was it that uh, you were notified and you and your family were notified that um, you would be resettled in the United States? Um, it is a little bit of a little bit of different process about the resettlement. It wasn't um, that you and it's here um, notified us. It's it's a process that you really have to go through. So there was a there was a form that you had to fill out. That's initial form that you uh, petitioning the government and UNHCR that I want to be resettled because um, I think there is a liability cost in there. So I think probably that's why they wanted to hear from the people in itself that they want resettlement, not UNHCR or any, any U.S. or resettlement countries. So when we did that, it took almost two years to hear from us that you know, we would like to um, hold you and ask you questions and do all this pre-screening interviews. And so that pre-screening process then led into the formal application. And how does that process work? How does the agency decide, okay, who's, who's going where and how many are going to which place? 
Um, well, there were seven uh, voluntary uh, first world countries that wanted to resettle um, Bhutanese refugees. But U.S. definitely was one of the... Uh, one one of the country that wanted to resettle uh, most of the refugees. I think back then it was almost uh, 100,000 um, people that they wanted to uh, resettle. So uh, eventually, as per the cases were processed, they would decide uh, if you are a torture of victim, if you are... Um, eligible candidate who can work, um, they would go to U.S. If you are a torture victim, they would go to Denmark. And, and as, per, as per the quotas that the resettle, resettling country have presented, that's how the U.S. would um, spread out all these um, families. Eventually, when the initial pre-screening had happened, then um, they would call us for another interview. And this was this interview was done by International Organization of Migration staff, and they would ask you all questions like you know your history, um, if you have involved in any political activities back home, if you support any um, idea of communism and things like that and such. Then once that has been cleared out, then you will have another interview with the UNHCR. And once you finish that interview with the UNHCR, then there would be an, another interview with Department of Homeland Security um, of a country whoever wants to resettle you. So you need to pass that um, DHS in an interview and then you will have a medical um, screening that you need to go through so that um, you are in terms of health wise you are good to travel so in that screening if you have any um, issues then that will hold you up a little bit of time as well so it is a process and it's a lengthy and very time consuming um, process for for me it was for us it was almost um almost two years actually um because of the fact that um we had to go through all that health screening when you and your family finally arrived in the united states stepping off of the plane how old were you i was i was in my i was a teenager late teenagers say so. so as a late teenager did you decide to go to school or high school or how how did that work did you have an option um, I did not have an option because of the fact that the, um, the agencies that would help you with the resettlement process and the resources are very limited and the need is huge. So in my, uh, in my regards, uh, there were only, um, three, um, able bodies, my two of my sisters and uh, myself who can work. Um, so I, I did not have an option to um, w go to school, no, in, in that regard. And of course, my parents uh, not being able to speak English and had to be there uh, to, as an interpreter in, in their appointments and such, um, it, there was no option, no. And how much English did you speak when you arrived? Um, just a little bit. I still remember uh, one incident. Um, I was, um, I think that was my first week here. And then I was, tr I was talking to one of the fellow and I was trying to tell him something about uh, development. And every time I was saying development and he wasn't getting it. So I had to um, write, write it down. And, and, and then he was like, oh, you said development. And I was like, yes. So it, Yes, it was a, just a little bit of English. Um, what sort of process did you go through to improve your English? Um, initially, we we went to I went to ESL classes that churches would offer, and also um, so I attended adult learning classes as well, and then um, and then I feel like this would work. So 
when I uh, finished my adult learning classes and such, and then I decided to go to college. So I started with the community college, and then eventually I spent one year, I studied one year in community college, and then I transferred to university at Albany, uh, New York. So in in 2013, I graduated with a degree in political science and international studies from the State University of New York at Albany. Um, so I want to skip ahead a little bit to your time working at um, Lutheran Services Carolina, um, which is a refugee resettlement agency in the Columbia area. Um, and I first want to ask, what made you decide to work with refugees and at-risk populations? Eventually, um, I feel the need um, of helping this at-risk, vulnerable population because once I have been that population and once I felt like there was somebody who helped me, so this is my, uh, this is my time to step up and help that population that once I was a part of. Um, and also when I was in college, I, I, I volunteered my time with um, at-risk youth in many different community organizations. So that, that encouraged me as well. So your experience pushed you to give back to those um, who you saw as having a similar experience to your own. Exactly, yes. And so at Lutheran Services Carolina, um, what sort of work were you involved in, um, and yeah, how did how did that work? Um, y- yeah, so um, after I graduated, um, I worked in Charlotte for a little bit. I was um, working um, in high school then, and then when I saw that uh, uh, Lutheran Services were hiring, I applied for that job, and then they offered me that job as a matching grant um, employment specialist. So as a matching grant employment specialist, I was um, responsible to find a job to newly arrived refugees and help them become self-sufficient. And on top of that, I was also responsible to go out and network with employers, tell them why they should hire refugees and how they can help them and how they can be a part of community and how they can achieve self-sufficiency on a timely manner as required by the Office of um, Refugee um, uh, one of the uh, federal agency of um, the U.S. Uh, so that that was my job, um, helping them to find a job, networking with the employers, teaching them about the U.S. job cycle, and um, teaching them about the uh, life in the U.S. To clarify, a matching grant is a government grant given to refugees who meet certain um, specifications as far as uh, working that having a job that's correct so um they, there are two different types of employment program one is a uh, refugee assistance program that's usually uh, funded through the state and there is matching grant which is funded through the federal uh, federal government so um, you cannot enroll in two different program at the same time as for the your need as per your uh, physical ability uh, you are enrolled in one or another because uh, the matching grant program has a limited time uh, that's that you really have to be self-sufficient and there are limited resources so yes what is that time window to self-sufficiency um, usually it's uh, the max is 180 days, uh, which is six months. But um, in my cases, uh, most of this cl- my clients had obtained their self-sufficiency as, or at least uh, as, a, as required by ORR, Office of Refugee Resettlement uh, Requirement, um, they would obtain in 120 days. And just to clarify, self-sufficiency, by that you mean um, independent of any 
any sort of aid from the agency, from Lutheran Services Carolina, that, which is from the federal government through. That's correct. And it does not count um, any other expenses. It, we will just be counting the gross um, gross income. And before enrolling uh, them to this program, we would we we would interview them. We would screen them just to see if they would be a good candidate or not. Um, so if they are, then then we will enroll them, and we will create a budget that would be basics. We are not talking here about um, car payment, insurance, or anything like that. It's just basics. Your rent, um, your lodging, and your footing. That's it. So six months seems like a quick turnaround for people who come to the United States, may have no um, formal training in the language, no family here to help support them. I'm curious how you think that they were able to achieve such a quick turnaround. Well, um, I'm glad that you asked this question because I personally don't think that's, um, that's valid either. Um, given the circumstances they come from, um, usually most of these um, refugees come with 40 pounds of their luggage with no cash in their hand. Or even if they have it, it's just going to be minimum of probably $10, $15. And when you just have initial support for six months, and on top of them, we are asking them to be self-sufficient. Um, it, it, it's a huge burden on them. But also, if we look at other way, um, there are lots of, um, this is an opportunity to start up a new life. So um, that's when the other local volunteers, uh, some local faith-based community get to come into play and try to help in any possible way they can. So um, to answer your question, it is hard. Um, it, it, I don't think it is reasonable to do that. But the, uh, when we see the circumstances, when we see the need in the world, there are, there are millions and millions of refugees and there needs to be a solution. They need to have an opportunity to um, start up a new life. When you look at that way and when the resources are limited, I think we need to be using the resources we have on hand um, accordingly to, to address the need as well. So it sounds like um, community involvement in that process outside of the agency and outside of the federal government is actually crucial to the resettlement of refugees and to helping them gain footing in the United States as far as getting a job, getting an apartment, getting a car, and, and going through all those steps? Um, e yes, um, especially um, getting a job, um, getting a car. Getting a car is community might help or in that it's a long process, but getting a job and, um, of course, um, housing for, the, for six months um, and a um, little bit of cash money. It's not a lot, but just a little bit of cash money to uh, catch a bus from one place to another um, that is being offered by the agency. But outside of that, sometimes you might need a, a thick jacket if you are resettled in New York. That's when the churches or community member can donate to them. Sometimes you might need a pots and pans to cook. Uh, that's when the community can help them. Sometimes they need a transportation to go uh, for a shopping. That's when the community come into play. So those are the things that community definitely can make an impact. Later on, after your work at Lutheran Services Carolina, you went to work at the SC Attorney General's office, um, specifically in the Victim Advocacy Division. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, so can you just talk about what the Victim Advocacy Division does, what was your role within that division? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, I uh, moved um, to the Attorney General's office um, to do victim advocacy work because I felt that's the need at the time. Um, usually, um, I don't know how familiar you are with the criminal system, but for someone uh, who 
does not have any idea about the criminal justice system, it they are fairly new to to that area. And if when they are victim and nobody is telling them about what's going on with the case that the state has or or the uh, county has prosecuted where they are victim, it's uh it's it's scary. It's they don't know nothing. So for them to be there and tell them the process, explain them the process and what are their rights and what are their duties, what they can expect um, from the prosecutor or from the state or from the county and to direct them to the resources that are available in the community, that that's what the victim advocacy does. And it bridges the it bridges the gap between the prosecutors and the victim because um, oftentimes it's not possible for victims to get hold of the prosecutors because they are traveling, they are constantly in the court, and that's when victim advocacy get to play the role. And sometimes it's easier when you have a tons and tons of cases, you have a pressure to move these cases really fast, and sometimes they... They fail to uh, notify uh, the victims about the proceeding, so that's when the victim advocacy division get to come into play, um, and that that was basically my responsibility, and basically advocating or being the voice for the victim in the criminal proceeding that they are involved in. Did you ever work with uh, refugees or other immigrant populations? Um, no, actually, um, not really. I think that's a uh, that's a good and bad thing. Good in a way that they are not being a victim, or um, even if they are being a victim, they are not being um, kept in the loop. I think I, I have worked with a um, couple families, those were immigrant from um, Latin America. But yeah, that was the only family, um, international community that I've worked with. Are you working in the Attorney General's office any longer? Um, no, currently I'm not working at the Attorney General's office. I worked there for two years and seven months, and I decided to run for the um, city council at large seat here in Colombia. The, the guidelines to the employer didn't allow me to work and yet run for the office. What motivated you to run for office? Um, I have been living here since 2015. Uh, actually, I have never thought um, uh, one day I would be running for um, office and in this capacity. But um, since 2015, I have been here in Colombia and couldn't help um, but to notice the untapped potential of Colombia has been ignored until this date. And um, I was frustrated to see that happening. Um, in a meanwhile, the um, it to me it felt like the uh, local government has been failed to fail in um, prioritizing the core government responsibilities such as economic development, public safety, um, infrastructure public discourse, interconnecting the city with the lower income communities. And since given given my background that I have been the voice to the voiceless community in different areas, I feel um, I would be the voice to all these uh, unheard voices on city council. Do you think that your experience, having been a former refugee yourself, has helped prepare you to serve on city council? Um, yes and no. He, he, yes, in a way that I might see uh, things um, in a different way than anybody else, but not in a direct way. So um, that does not, uh, my, my background as a refugee does not um, coordinate with the position that I'm running, running for. So it more so provides you with a experience that is different from others serving on the city council so it's um, more of a of an idea of diversity of thought and of experience that might give you a better or a different perspective that others might not have that's correct yes sir my next question and and hearing hearing your story um, today at least for me um, the American dream kind of comes to mind and I was curious um, what do you think defines the American dream, or what does it mean to you? Um, I think that's a, 
a really good question, um, Tyler, uh, and I'm glad that you asked me because um, especially people, we hear American Dream from all of the people running for office. Um, to me, American Dream is a little bit different. Um, it's freedom of expression. It's, um, it's your freedom where you can um, use without any fear of prosecution or without any fear of being uh, being jailed or anything like that, to be free uh, and to enjoy that freedom is in itself is an American dream, and of course that would lead you lead towards the pursuit of happiness. How do you think refugees fit into that American dream? Um, definitely, um, they are getting this new opportunity to start off their new life from the scratch. I know, uh, even from my experience, it's very hard, but they are very focused. They, they know they have been through this hardship um, in either living in a third, um, third country or in a refugee camp. Even, w even when you don't have a citizenship, um, it, it feels... It feels bad. Even your own people, even your own ethnic people wouldn't care um, because they feel like you are there to snatch their job or anything like that. And that's the when you don't have a citizenship, it's 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 there's something that's missing. And when refugees come in the United States and are able to obtain that citizenship, that speaks to to a volume that they now they have a country where they belong to. Now they have a sense of belonging, and they are able to um, express their mind, express their thought. And sky is the only limit to their thoughts and vision. If you could talk to the millions of refugee populations out there, you had a, a message um, to share with them who, who have been displaced from their home country, who, who might not have the option of being repatriated and, and returning, um, who someday might hope to go to the United States or, or, or some other country. Um, what would you say to them? Just hang in tight. I know it's, it's hard Sometimes it's hard because you don't have a proper access to the basic needs. And other time it's hard because you don't have a country that you belong to. Um, it's hard, but just hang in there. Do, do what you need to do. Um, try your best to be good at what you're doing. Obtain some skills. Um, one day that might be useful um, when you resettle or, or um, just be a good human being. And so from your perspective, being a former refugee, how do you think that the national dialogue surrounding refugees, how, how do you evaluate that at the moment? Um, I think I have a little different perspective because of the fact that of course, it is a great opportunity. It's a great way to provide third country resettlement. But I think in most cases, if if U.S. is in a position to uh, create a dialogue with these um, countries to push them for repatriation, that would be the other way to do as well. But in the meantime, while well, I said that resettlement option needs to be always open because of the fact that it's a huge crisis and this crisis and all these refugees are the numbers um, the total number of refugees uh, behind these numbers are human being like you and I and they don't they don't need our sympathy they just need an opportunity where they can start up their new life talking about that opportunity and um going off of our discussion about the role and importance of community in the refugee resettlement process, what type of things um, can people do to get involved in uh, helping the local refugee community through that resettlement process and even um, beyond that initial resettlement period? 
Um, I think there are a whole bunch of uh, opportunities for anyone who would like to get involved with the refugees communities. Um, if you are a member of a faith-based community, you can always pray. Um, if your churches have a ESL classes, uh, please um, bring them to ESL classes. If someone has a hard um, in providing transportation, please do that. If someone have a hard to go to their um, home and teach English, please do that. If someone wants to hire them, um, if they are an employer, please do that because these are hardworking people and they will help you um, in your staff turnover. So uh, I just want to thank you um, for coming out today and for speaking with us, Amadeo. And um, for the listeners real quick, uh, I guess, when when is the election for city council or, or for, for the position at least that you're running for on the city council? Um, well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm glad that um, you invited me for this podcast. Um, and regarding the election, the election is on November the 5th. And if you are a registered voter, please go and vote. Um, please um, use your um, right and cast your vote not just because you know this candidate or you know that candidate, but because you genuinely think that uh, this candidate has a potential to change and be that change. So where can, um, where can listeners find out more about your campaign? Uh, well, I do have my Facebook page, Amadio for Columbia City Council at Large Seat, and also I have my website www.amadeogiri.com A-M-A-D-E-O-G-E-E-R-E.com awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for listening to Seeking Refuge. If you have a story you'd like to share, get in touch with us by sending us an email at seekingrefugepodcast at gmail.com. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Seeking Refuge Podcast, and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Special thanks to Amadio Giri for being on this episode. Our show wouldn't be made possible without the wonderful support from Maxi International House at the University of South Carolina. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. <laughs>